Uh, one of the things exciting, you know, in the previous years, we haven't had a patient panel. So I'm so grateful and thankful for the, for the patients who have offered to come up and talk a little bit about their experience. And we're going to open it up for them to be able to talk about not only their experience, but you can also ask them questions about their experience. So we want to thank our, our, our panel that's coming up. So I'd like to introduce our, our patient panel. We have uh, Gay Rogers, we have Tony Leonard, and Pat Coppola. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm just going to ask a couple of questions. You know, we're going to we're going to finish it. To, you know, we have going to finish it about 20 minutes and so or so. And one of the things we'd like to talk about, you know, thank you for being here. Is we want to talk about when you were diagnosed and what was your experience. Just a couple of lines. So you know, if we can please start with Gay. Okay, good afternoon. I was diagnosed in 2007 with stage two stomach cancer. Um, I had a partial gastrectomy uh, and followed by chemotherapy and radiation uh, regimen of DCF and then um, in between cycles there was the five weeks of chemo and radiation together. And are you on anything right now? Or? Oh no, I'm. Um, my last treatment was in February 2008, and I've been cancer-free since, and just get monitored every year. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. Great. Tony. Hello. My name is Tony Leonard. Uh, I was diagnosed in February of 2012. Uh, I had uh, five weeks of radiation, chemo. Um, followed by a three-week break, and then I had a uh, infusion, three infusion rounds of uh, Zolota, um, Epirubicin, and Oxyplatin. And uh, I've been cancer-free for two years, and uh, that's about it. That's great. <laughs> Fantastic. I mean, that, you can't say that lightly, cancer-free for two, two years. It's, it's amazing. Thank you. Well, uh, as far as my experience, when you get that initial diagnosis, you have cancer, and it's stomach cancer, uh, you immediately go into a severe uh, reaction. And I uh, would love to meet the person who doesn't. And, you know, the next fear you have is, is this going to take my life? And when is that going to happen? Uh, because of the way our medical system is, they'll tell you you have been diagnosed with stomach cancer, but what lies before you will determine, uh, you know, the extent of your cancer or the treatment you're going to receive. And that's a period of time that you are in limbo and you have very few resources to, uh, to consult with. Uh, you go to the internet and you get a lot of uh, statistics, uh, misinformation or information and you really don't know what to do with it. Uh, then you start the, the process of getting into the medical system where the, uh, your, your stage is determined, your treatment is determined, and then uh, uh, for me, uh, I ended up with a subtotal gastrectomy. I had some lymph node uh, involvement, so I required uh, uh, chemo and radiation. But the, the time between the surgery and the chemo and radiation was a, a very trying time because I wasn't quite sure uh, what was the next best treatment, what type of chemo uh, should I have radiation? And I consulted uh, three different oncologists, and I got three great different opinions, okay? And so at that point, you end up saying, well, now what do I do? You know, I, I, I talked to reputable people, I got uh, their best advice, and, and so I was really in, in a quandary. Uh, I ended up uh, seeking the uh, experts at a, a local cancer uh, center, uh, Moffitt Cancer Center, and, uh, and I accepted a protocol that I thought was, uh, uh, was well thought out and, and, and applied to, to my specific situation. But, but all that is a, is a very uh, extremely anxious time in your life and if it wasn't for my, my, my wife and the people around me to support me in, 
in helping me through that time, uh, I'm sure uh, it would have been much more difficult. Mm, thank you very much for that. Um, if there was anything that you had to share with any of the other patients and people that are here, you know, something that you wanted to talk to them about and share with them about your journey through your, you know, from diagnosis to where you are today, what would that be? Okay, well, um, alluding to a little bit of what Pat said about when you're first diagnosed, that's, to me, was the scariest time. You don't yet know what lies ahead. They often don't know your stage yet when they first diagnose you, so you have no idea what the future holds at all, and then you feel very out of control. Um, when I was diagnosed, my two sons were in high school. My husband and I had just celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary, and suddenly it seemed like wow, my life has changed forever. But as time goes on um, and you start to talk to doctors and you start to come up with a plan, um, the anxiety level does go down a bit. Even though you still have a long journey ahead of you and chemotherapy and radiation and surgery could be rough at times and you'll, um, it can off, you can often feel like you're just not going to survive treatment. You know, you, if you survive cancer, you may not survive the treatment. But, um, but I think what I would like to say to any patients that are currently going through this, that if you try to step back, take it one step at a time, try to live in the moment, and deal with what you have to deal with that day. Um, a friend of mine said to me, don't stop wasting your nows worrying about the what ifs. And um, she was right. Once I got myself into the present moment and thought about, okay, today, right now, at this moment, I feel fine. I'm doing well, and I'm going to not worry about what's going to happen tomorrow. And if it was, you know, when I had to worry about a treatment day when I knew I wasn't going to feel well for a while, I worried about it when it, I didn't worry about it. I just, it, when it happened, it happened. So I would say to patients just to try to take it one day at a time, try not to get overwhelmed, and the initial, if you're still in your initial diagnosis stage, that, that you are going through the scariest time right now. Mm. Yeah. Well, um, one, of the, one of the biggest things is, uh, you know, everybody goes through the, the initial, um, you know, why me phase, you know, I, I do this, what have I done to deserve this, so forth. So. Um, no. But once you go through your treatment, uh, I had a total gastrectomy, whichever one they choose, your chemo, radiation, and stuff. There's really no after um, assistance, like the doctors and, and nurses and so forth. They kind of just go the other direction because they figure that you're, they're done with you. You know, you've had your surgery, you've been to your chemo and radiation and stuff. So there's just not a lot of. Uh, help after that point or assistance and having you know one of the biggest things the greatest things I had was I had you know uh, my wife she's having a great advocator for you somebody that's gonna stand up and say you know that's that's not correct or they're looking after your best means or your best the best care that you can get and making sure that uh, you're being well taken care of and they don't, they're not afraid to ask the question, you know, that you're afraid to ask, you know. And because uh, as a patient, you're going through so much, and you have so much going through your head, you need a person that stands next to you that can do the research for you, you know. When I, when I was diagnosed, I didn't, I didn't go online. I didn't look, look it up. I didn't look at no figures. I mean, you look at the figures, man, all you can do is sit there and cry. Um, my wife did all that. I didn't find out what the, my numbers were for living were until uh, three months ago. You know, because if you go off the numbers that are online, then you might as well always kind of give up hope and stuff. And, you know, hope is, is one of the biggest things that you have in your battle to fight this. You have to have hope, you have to believe, you have to have faith. If you don't have any other one of those, then you might as well just go ahead and dig a hole and lay in it because uh, you don't beat this, you know, by yourself, number one. Number two, you don't beat this with drugs or whatever. You beat this with, 
faith, hope, you know, and the people around you to help you and pick you up on the days that you can't stand and so forth. Thank you for that. Well, my, my advice is to make sure you've got a great team of people around you. Uh, uh, I have an oncologist that uh, uh, has a great team around him. Matter of fact, I want to acknowledge that most of them are sitting right over there, and I frequently go for iron treatments. I have uh, anemia as associated with my condition. And I have to tell you, it's, after I go for the treatments and having seen these people work, uh, how they work and how pleasant they are and, and how they impact the patients that come in, I, I actually feel good about going to my oncologist. Okay, now that seems kind of uh, a different way, but thank you, thank ladies. You. Have a great team around you. <laughs> Thank you so much for those stories, and you know, I, I hear you know three central avenues um, that comes through in what you've all shared right now. And number one is you know live in the moment, two have hope, and three really have a support group around you. Um, one other question I do want to ask the panel, and we can open up to questions: is how has um, uh, Debbie's Dream Foundation, um, you know, curing stomach cancer affected your life. <laughs> Debbie's Dream has has been is it's an amazing organization. I back in two thousand seven, Debbie's Dream did not exist. Debbie's probably stomach cancer was the farthest thing from Debbie's mind at that time, um, and there was not a lot of information support, resources, anything out there on stomach cancer. Um, coincidentally, I was treated at Hopkins and my surgeon was Dr. Michael Chody, who became part of the medical advisory board for Debbie's Dream Foundation. That's how I learned of Debbie's Dream. I was, it was about two years later, I was at a follow-up visit. He told me about it. He said, now that you're a survivor, you don't, may not need support, but maybe you can offer support. So I became involved. I became the Maryland chapter founder. I'm a patient resource education uh, mentor. And Debbie's, the, it's the two years that I've been involved, the amount of information, we all, at the time I became involved, I thought it was amazing, all the information that was available to stomach cancer patients. And in these past two years, it's just grown by leaps and bounds. Um, I am proud and honored to be part of the organization. I am grateful to have survived to be here to help out, to help other patients. Um, and I experienced my first advocacy day in February, which was amazing. And um, I am just, I, I just really can't express how it has changed my life. It has given me exact, as I went through treatment, I thought, if I survive this, I need to do something, but I really didn't know how or or how to begin, but when I learned of Debbie and her organization, it was just, it was a perfect fit. It was a no-brainer for me to become involved. And, um, you know, and uh, often, you know, I was stage two, and often people would, you know, say, oh, well, stage two, that's early, that's very curable, and not for stomach cancer. You know, it's, it's stage two, early stage stomach cancer is very different than early stage um, at most other cancers. Um, it's not very cur cur curable. I was very lucky, and you know, and again, we don't like to think about the numbers, but even at stage two, I only had a 30% chance to be sitting here in front of you today, um, after you know five-year survival, and to be here to talk to you. And so, um, it's something that we definitely should need to all advocate um, and speak to our representatives about because it's it's an important. Uh, topic and it's very different than any than any other cancer and we don't get like Debbie had expressed the um, the least amount of cancer funding per cancer death mm. so I'm yeah. proud and honored to be part of the organization <laughs> thank you Just, if I could say something here because I know some of you came in a little late and probably did not have uh, heard um, Debbie's um, presentation earlier, we actually have chapters across the United States and we're expanded, 
expanding to you know globally to other countries and you know gay actually after seeing the organization uh, is part of our uh, chapter leads our chapter uh, in the was it the Washington DC Maryland. Maryland area so thank you so much for your committed help thank you and so um, uh, Debbie's dream has has been uh, for me is a uh, has been leaps and bounds. Uh, it's kind of hard to explain how how wonderful uh, the organization has been. Uh, I mean, I, I go to Duke. I go to a, a pretty pristine hospital to get my care and so forth. And, and believe it or not, there's really not something there that says, "Hey, call this person, or you can call these people, or they'll call you to help you, or if you have questions or whatnot." You know, because stomach cancer is is one of those popular cancers. It's not like breast cancer, you know, or something. It's, it's not one that everybody talks about. It's one of those unheard uh, killers and so forth. So when I was first, my wife uh, was contacted uh, for Debbie's Dream and so forth, and she was like, you know, hey, we, I found somebody, you know, they're gonna help us. Uh, we got questions or whatnot. And, Gay called me right after I got, a, I think, uh, right after I got out of the hospital. I was, I was like, who's this? <laughs> My wife's like, oh, she's from Debbie's Dream. She's going to talk to you about, you know, you got questions. I'm like, what, you know, I'm, that's just me. I'm like, what questions? I don't want to talk to nobody. <laughs> so, so I got to start talking to her. And, so on, and you know, I, I learned a lot uh, from it. And she was kind of telling me, and, you know, you, you just, when everything starts hitting you and you find out, um, uh, there's a lot of questions and there's a lot of what ifs and there's a lot of things you don't know and you know I, it, I, we should have called and asked more questions you know than we did and so forth but um, I had a, uh, an article written up on me uh, back home in the paper um, a real nice article and it was just talking about how you know I beat cancer and you know because I coached football and I was coaching while I was in chemo and stuff and the things I do for the kids and, and all the other good stuff. So uh, a guy in uh, one of the other counties in North Carolina, um, probably three hours away, had seen the article and he was just diagnosed with cancer. And he called the local paper and said, hey, can I get his contact number? I'd really like to talk to him um, because, you know, we don't know what to do. And. Uh, this might make me cry a little bit, but um, so they called us, and uh, I was really excited to talk to him. And I was like, "Hey, you know, he was stage two. And uh, I was really excited that he called because I was like, "Hey, you mean you know somebody's calling me? I can actually help somebody." And uh, I started talking to him, and was talking to his wife, and I mean they were really, really shaken up by this, and we were you know, recommending people where they to go, and they were going to Duke too also, um, you know, and they, he, uh, he went through everything, and you know, he had partial done, and you know, he's, after treatment, he was doing okay and so forth, but he was just losing a lot of weight and stuff, and he'd call, and we, you know, we'd keep close contact with him, and then, um, uh, he kind of got sick a little bit and whatnot, and, uh, he got put in the hospital. Matter of fact, he was in the hospital while we were at uh, on advocacy day, and uh, like I said, you know, he was only stage two, and uh, they just couldn't get him uh, well enough, and he finally uh, couldn't breathe. I guess he was fatigued so much he couldn't breathe on his own, so I had to put him on a respirator and stuff. And uh, they were just they tried everything they could, and you know, we ended up ended up, ended up losing him shortly after that. Um, just from, not from the cancer, but from the other, you know, the after effects of what cancer would do to you and how it leaves your body just uh, so weak and fragile, you know. I mean, you, you, if you knew me before I got sick and so forth, I used to be a pretty big dude. I mean, I had 19-inch arms. I was, I'd bench 350 pounds, you know, I was, I was a pretty big dude. I, you know, I could do uh, P90X and, and Sandy like it was nothing. 
And uh, look at me now. Uh, I can barely do 10 push-ups. And I'm two years post-treatment, and I can still barely do 10, 15 push-ups. So, you know, it's not just getting the cancer out of your body and curing you, it's, it's a lot more than that because it does so much damage to you overall and the treatment just does so much damage. You can look at my bag on the table, it's full of pills, you know, and I'm on three uh, opiates and anything you can imagine pill taking, I've got it in my bag over there and I have to take it you know, all day long. It's just, like I said, you know, um, it leaves you that way. But to get back to the point, you know, Debbie's dream is, is Given me the hope, you know, and the faith and the willpower to, to drive on, to want to help people, to, you know, give somebody a shoulder to cry on, to cry with them yourself, you know. Uh, especially being a man, you know, men don't cry. It's, that's what they say, men don't cry. But when you get hit with something like this, believe me, there's nothing like crying with another man and telling them, hey, I'm here for you, and I love you, and that, you know, whatever you need, I'm going to give you everything I got, and this foundation is going to give you everything they've got, you know, and, you know, they're always there for you, 24-7, no matter what. So, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Well, Debbie's Dream Foundation really came in my life at the right time. And I happened to, by accident, meet Debbie at my oncologist's office. Didn't know who she was, sitting there, and she was writing something, and we got talking, and before you know it, uh, I was hooked. And uh, I've never been able to say no to Debbie, okay? That's the <laughs> biggest problem. And I find myself uh, uh, being a mentor and enjoying that, saying, gee, you know, that, that is something good I've been doing. And it's all because of the organization and the people within her organization who work very hard. Let me tell you, there's only, a, I thought there was a staff of 10 or 12 people, uh, but, you know, come to find out there's only a couple of people that do all this work and everything else is volunteer. And so it, it's been the best use of my time uh, and I gladly give my time to help the cause and, and help Debbie in her dream. So it's been great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You know, one of the things that, you know, I just heard here is um, what about the, you know, this organization is that you're all recommending is to get involved. Um, you learn a lot when you get involved. And I think what was just wonderful that I got out of this is, um, you know, out of the despair that you're in, once you get diagnosed, you actually became the light for others. So thank you so much for that. And uh, really. And I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience. Anybody have any questions for our panel? Comments? We have one in the front here. Uh, Tony, this question is for you. I understand that you suffer from Lanitis Plastica. Yeah. Is that right? Yes. Uh, very difficult to detect, so what were your symptoms and how were you diagnosed? Um, I didn't really have any symptoms at all. Uh, I was uh, stage 3B and my tumor was stage 4, um, but basically, you know, I used to eat a lot of hot food because I'm, I'm, I'm half Korean and uh, I had got my mom, I had bought these new noodles and uh, I mean they were really hot. I'm talking just really, really hot. And I was eating them, and I started getting, you know, these burning, like, sensations in my stomach, like an ulcer. And I'm like, oh, you know, it's just the noodles. And I had, like, a whole case, so I'm still eating them. And I'm telling my wife, hey, you know, I'm having these problems. You know, my stomach kind of hurt a little bit. And I just, I was coming close to my, my yearly checkup. She called my doctor. And she said, you make sure he tells you about his stomach because he will not say, he'll just come in there and say, I'm good, and then go. And that's me, I'm, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm good. Whether I'm sick or not, I'm good. I don't like going to the doctor. So I went in there and he's like, well, we're gonna send you down and get you scoped just to be on the safe side. So we went to the 
I got it set up. We went to the doctor. They did the endoscopy and stuff. And we went and seen that post visit. And he's like, oh, everything looks good. You know, uh, we'll, we'll uh, send this off, wait for your results from your biopsies to come back. And a couple of weeks, you'll be good to go. So we leave. We're happy and stuff, you know. Um, about a week later, they call my wife. It's a Friday. Or is it a Thursday? It's a Thursday or Friday afternoon. And they say, um, well, I don't know when they called her, but she called me that afternoon and said, hey, your doctor wants to see you Saturday morning. I said, Saturday morning? I said, I got a football game or something Saturday morning. So my thought was, you know, hey, it's got to be bad because these doctors, you know, it's a private practice. They don't work on Saturdays. So if they want to see me on a Saturday, something's got to be really bad. And that's when we went to the doctor, and he's like, hey. He walks in the door, and we're like, hey, how you doing? And, and he's like, yeah, uh, you know, I'll, you're too young. That's all he could say was, you're too young. You're too young. I'm like, I'm too young. What, what do you mean, I'm too young? Oh, you're too young, you're too young. Dude, get to the point, you know. And I finally said, so, I mean, what is it? Is it cancer? He's like, yeah, you have cancer. Your biopsies came back, and... Uh, they're cancerous cells. And I said, well, what kind is it? He goes, I don't know. It took, literally, it took weeks. It took a little while. Um, we didn't find out exactly what kind of cancer it was until I went to Duke and sat down with a surgeon, and he told us finally what kind of cancer it was. It took a, it took a couple of weeks. And the one thing the doctor, the surgeon, told my wife was do not go online and Google this stuff. Because anybody knows lionized plastica knows that this is, if you see anybody that has lionitis and is still walking today, it's a rarity. I mean, it's a miracle. It, it truly is, it's a miracle. Because this is a cancer, stomach cancer, that you just don't come back from. It, it, it's, it's really nasty. And my, my, the other surgeon told us that the morning of surgery, he comes in there, and I'm laying in the bed. I got all the tubes in me, you know, and I'm like, let's go. Let's do this. It's too easy, you know. And uh, he walks in. He goes, hey, I'm Dr. Perez. Uh, this is some really bad, he said, the S word, but stuff. And uh, if it's spread outside your stomach or we can't get your stomach out or if we can't do this or we can't do that, I'm just going to close you up and tell you to have a nice life you know, the short one that you're gonna have, you know, but, and my wife stands up and says, I don't think so. That ain't what Dr. Pappas did. The main surgeon, my, my surgeon is the dean of medical affairs at Duke. He's, he's the big dog. So she's like, Mr. Dr. Pappas said, we're gonna get it out no matter what. And uh, he did, I don't know how he got it out, but technically speaking, um, they should've just closed me up. But one thing he promised, uh, Dr. Pappas promised me and my wife was, no matter what, what stage it is, if I can get it out, I'm going to get your stomach out. And uh, he sure did, you know, because if it had been anybody else, they would have seen my stomach and they would have closed me right back up. So I, I, I praise God every day for that man and, and what he has done to give me the, the extra years I'm here breathing still to spend with my family, my kids, my, all my friends to help anybody else, you know, with Debbie's Foundation or anybody else that has stomach cancer or any other type of cancer. I mean, I'm at work and, you know, I'm a pretty popular person at work. And uh, everybody comes to me now that has cancer or their friends have cancer because they just don't know. I mean, once you get cancer, it's just not like you're, it's like you join a club. I'm in a cancer club now, you know. So you're in a club now that has got a very strange membership. And, you know, everybody comes to me and says, hey man, you know, I just was just diagnosed with prostate cancer. Well, you know, I don't know what to do. I'm panicking. You know, I'm about to lose it here. I'm like, okay, calm down. You know, and I pull up the statistics page that I got from Debbie. And that tells you, you know, what your life is expected. And, and, and I show it to Mike, look dude, don't be so scared. Cause look, I'm gonna tell you right now. Me, you should be scared if you was me. 
I said, but your stuff is right here. It says you're going to have like a 100% chance to live. <laughs> why, are you, why are you panicking? You know, mm -hmm. they're going to zip, zip on you a little bit and you'll be out the door. Call it a day. So, you know, I do, I do thank uh, everything that has been brought to me here and, and the people that I've met and, and the support I get from this foundation and, and the new friends I meet every day. And uh, I do thank everybody here. Thank you. Any Thank more you, questions? Tony. Well, if there's no more questions, you know, I'd, I'd like to thank all of you for, you know, it was a long day and you stayed throughout this, uh, all these great presentations. Thank you for your presence here and your support. Uh, I'd like to thank so much our um, patients who came up here and, and, and shared their, you know, this is a very intimate conversation that we have here, and uh, I think we all enjoyed having this part as uh, the educational program, so thank you so much. Uh, one of the things I'd like to do is um, just so you know that, you know, we're having the gala this evening. If you would want, like, a ticket, please um, go outside and, and um, purchase a ticket. I'd like to thank uh, quite a few people for being here as well and for helping here. I'd like to thank our, our co-sponsor, Prime Oncology, who uh, co-sponsored this event um, for the education. And I'd like to thank our um, supporters, because without this, we really couldn't do this, uh, especially our title supporter, Lily Oncology, who really helped us out a lot. So thank you very much. I'd also like to thank my committee, um, you know, my uh, Peter Sprague's in the back, who's a behind the scenes did an enormous amount of work along with our the rest of the 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 team uh, members and you know thank you so much for your support um, one other thing I want to say is that please go to the website I don't know if all you know this you can actually go to our website and you can click on I don't know how many languages and the whole website is translated into many languages so I know that I bumped into a Spanish colleague in the restroom you can click on it and it, everything will come out in Spanish. So, um, you know, please um, visit our website and you will see the slides and all uh, posted on our website um, in the very near future. So thank you very much for a wonderful program. Thank you. Thank you.